Welcome to another episode of the Two Shots Podcast. Uh, today we're going to be joined by a very special guest. We're going to be joined by the one and only, my good friend here, Noah Magarro George. Noah, how's it going? And Noah is also uh, a writer for Pounding the Rock, uh, amongst other places where you can find him. I believe they can also find you on, was it Locker Room, right? After games sometimes? You can find me Locker Room, YouTube, uh, Twitter, all that good stuff, all that good stuff. But I- I'm great. I'm great, Joe. I'm-, I'm happy to be joining you here. I always love talking Spurs basketball with you, so I'm doing great. Yeah, it's always fun to have you on because we like to discuss some of the numbers, you know, and lineups what we're going to be getting into here. Uh, and even though it's a small sample size, we're still going to go ahead and talk about that. But, you know, before we start getting into all that, let's talk about the San Antonio Spurs, because at the time of this recording, this is going to be pre-recorded and is being pre-recorded right now before we actually record the 100th episode of the Two Shots podcast, which that is going to be coming out before this episode. So we're in a kind of bizarro world right now, <laughs> but that's just the way things work for time. You know, we have to record when we got the time. And right now, me and you were free on this Friday. So <laughs> we got to do this. But the San Antonio Spurs actually won against the Detroit Pistons uh, by a final score of 106 to 91. San Antonio looked pretty good in this game, you know, for about three quarters, you know, <laughs> and then they kind of let the pistons come back you know and they made it interesting very interesting but i was very proud of this team because they found ways to win whereas maybe before they would have folded gotten nervous and started making bad decisions we can see noah that when given the playing time the team is actually starting to grow especially some of the younger core and making better decisions down the stretch in crunch time what did you think I mean, I was happy with the game yesterday. Um, you know, Spurs were missing DeMar, DeJounte, and Patty. Of course, the Pistons were missing Jeremy Grant, Corey Joseph, and Mason Plumley. So it was kind of like, a, I think, an even split there. But I was happy. I mean, Trey Jones got minutes. Vassell got minutes. Luka got minutes. Um, you know, Luka wasn't super productive in those minutes. He still showed some encouraging flashes. But I really wanted to shout out Trey Jones. Uh, five points, five assists. He actually took and made a three which was like the biggest weakness for him coming out of the draft was just his willingness to shoot the three. And then also when he did shoot it to make it. So maybe he's making some strides there. Maybe he's, you know, convincing pop. He needs minutes down the line. Uh, but, but a good game, you know, they won by what, like 16, 15 points, which is, a, is, it's always good to win at home, especially when they haven't been playing that well at home this season. And let's also talk about the decision-making uh, by one Trey Jones. He has great uh, vision when it comes to him being able to see What's going out there in the court, you know, especially being able to read the defense, making this great decisions with the ball, finding the open man. He had five assists in his limited minutes that he had. Uh, and there, after the game, everybody was raving about him, you know, from, you know, Bally Sports. Sean Elliott was talking about him. Everybody was talking about him. Matt Bonner was talking about him. And they were saying, you know, that the kid kind of looks NBA ready. I'm like, hold on there. It's a small sample size and he does look really good. Um, But, you know, trying to get more minutes for the kid is kind of tough right now. But in the limited run that he did have, he looked really good. I mean, I I saw that. You saw that. And so did a lot of other Spurs fans. They took to Twitter and they were saying how impressed they were by one Trey Jones. What do you expect for next season? Do you think we'll see more of this kid out on the court or he's going to be delegated to trash minutes? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to know. I think if Patty's coming back, which he probably will, it'll be another uphill battle for Trey Jones to win minutes. I, I did want to say, though, I had a first-round grade on Trey Jones. Um, I did think he was going to go in the second round. But as far as point guards go in a normal draft, he would probably have been drafted in the first round. So he had the talent. I thought he was NBA ready. Um, you know, his brother is one of the best backup point guards in the NBA, Tyus Jones is. And, and I think he's very similar to his brother. He's taller than his brother. He's longer than his brother. He's a little more athletic than his brother. Doesn't shoot the ball as well. But I think he could be really good down the line as a sort of backup point guard or even a spot starter when the Spurs are missing somebody. But again, you know, if Patty's going to be here next season, which I think everybody kind of expects that to happen, it's there's going to be competition for him. There's by no means, uh, you know, Pop is not just going to hand him the minutes. Yeah. And we better have Patty come back. I want to see Patty retire as a San Antonio Spur. He deserves it. I don't care what other you know Spurs fans have to say about Patty, and he's getting long in the tooth, and you know they have a lot of negative things to say, not only about Patty but also about Rudy Gay as well. And, and I've been one of those people too from time to time. When he has a bad game, I call him out. You know, when Rudy Gay. But at the end of the day, I thank him for what they've been able to do for this team, uh, especially one Patty Mills. I hope one day. We see him walk off the court for the last time in a San Antonio Spurs uniform. I think that everybody 
would be happy with that, including you, right, Noah? Oh, of course. Yeah, I mean, Patty Mills is one of my favorite players that I've, I've ever watched with the Spurs. His energy is infectious. His smile is infectious. Um, he's a great leader. Um, but but I, I, I think where I like differ a little bit is I, I really think it would be fine. And I and I, I want to make this clear. I'm not advocating for Patty or Rudy to be <laughs> there we go um, and not play any <laughs> minutes. Right. That's not what I want. But if they're not playing well, I would love to see Popovich make an in-game, ro- you know, uh, adjustment. You know, if someone's, you know, two for 12 or four of 10 or three of 13, there's no reason to keep them out there for the full 24, 25 minutes that they've been getting over the last month. Um, you know, there's a guy called uh, Trey Jones, Devin Vassell, Luka Shamanich on the bench. They've been sort of productive, and at the very least, they're they're young players who you invested draft picks in and who you yeah. need to indre- invest minutes in. So, exactly. um, love Patty, love Rudy. I, I think they're both outstanding human beings. I appreciate what they've done for the Spurs, but on nights when they're not feeling it, I, I really do think that it wouldn't hurt to get some of the young guys in there and get them experience, especially if the Spurs are down double digits already. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things we're we're going to get into right now is something that I think is going to surprise Spurs fans a little bit, but but let let's go into this <laughs> with full disclosure here. What we're going to be talking about are lineups. Specifically, we're going to go ahead and take Devin Vassell first and how productive he's been in these lineups with the San Antonio Spurs. But really, let's let's take a pause here and pump the brakes because what we're about to tell you, what stats wise is a very small sample size because Devin Vassell has not had a lot of minutes, but we're going to show how impactful he has been in the limited minutes that he's had on the court. Now, again, small sample size here, people. We're not talking the whole season because he hasn't played in every single game. So with that said, we're going to go ahead and look at at Devin Vassell and how productive he's been with some of these lineups out there on the court. And I think one of the lineups that really stood out at me, and I talked to you before we even came on and started recording, was for all the flack that Rudy Gay has gotten, one of the most productive lineups that we have when Devin Vassell has been out there on the court is with one Rudy Gay, Patty Mills, DeJounte Murray, Yaka Portal, and Devin Vassell. Uh, Per 100 possessions, the plus minus as far as points go, the highest uh, rating that I can see here with this particular lineup out on the court per 100 possessions is going to be plus 29.6. That's that's pretty surprising to me, Noah. Um, especially, you know, how Spurs fans feel about one Rudy Gay and about Patty Mills. And then you have, you know, Devin Vassell, DeJounte, and Yaka Portal in there. It's a good mixture, I think, of vets plus the youth, you know, and Let's face it, you know, DeJounte Murray and Yaka Portal aren't rookies. Devin Vassell is. So Devin Vassell being able to keep keep pace with this lineup says a lot about the kid. You know, the kid is very smart. He has a really high basketball IQ, great defender, has an amazing stroke. I mean, this kid's going to be something special, especially with his shot, his release. Uh, not only does he have a mid-range game, he can get to the rim, and he also has a pretty decent shot from beyond the arc. I think this is a, a well-rounded basketball player that we're see, seeing in Devin Vassell. So thoughts, Noah, what do you got to say about this particular lineup as far as their net rating per 100 possessions? Yeah, and, and I know a lot of people are probably not going to be happy if they're Rudy supporters or Patty supporters, but um, yeah, I really think that both of those players are sort of net zeros. I don't think they're adding enough on one end to negate what they do on the other. Um, Rudy has been... Pretty fantastic as a defender this season. He has one of the highest defensive Raptors in the NBA. Um, and so he's been really excellent in his defensive role. On the other end, it's career lows pretty much across the board, right? With the exception of his three-point percentage. And with Patty, um, you know, he's always been a net negative on the defensive end. He doesn't offer a lot of positional versatility. Um, he doesn't have the length to really bother the passing lanes. He, he does uh, occasionally whiff on passes, and then he leaves the defense exposed. He gets beat on backdoor cuts. Uh, and, and with how poorly he's played recently in, in the lineup in terms of his shooting, um, which is pretty much all he brings at this point of his career, I, I just don't think that they're adding that much. I think you have more impactful uh, you know, play coming from DeJounte, from Yaka Pertl, and, and Vassell has been a little inconsistent shooting the ball from game to game, albeit he hasn't really had very consistent minutes recently. But he's, to me, one of the top 10 to 15 team defenders in the NBA. I mean, he he was that was my evaluation of him coming out of college, was that he was the best team defender 
in his draft class, and he's lived up to that. You know, he's been excellent in the passing lanes. He's excellent as a help defender. He knows when to rotate. He stunts. He digs. He does all the little stuff that you want to see. Um, but he just doesn't have very many minutes to his name. So like you said, small sample size with Vassell. But as far as the other guys, I think my opinion's pretty much solidified on them, regardless of, um, you know, the, the, the plus minus or the net rating. Yeah, you know, but just it goes to show you that I, I think that Devin Vassell has a high ceiling. You know, we've barely been able to see what the kid can do, and he's looked great so far in the limited run that he's ha that he has had. Looking forward to him getting more minutes come next season, more minutes after that, you know, and sooner or later I think he's going to find his way into the rotation, you know, um, and whatever aspect the coaching staff at that point in time wants to go ahead and utilize him as. We don't know if he's going to become a starter. Is he going to be a backup? What What's going to happen, you know? So I think the future is bright nonetheless for one Devin Vassell, and I look forward to seeing him grow, you know? And if I could add something real quick before we move on from yeah. Devin, I think it's important to remember, like, at the very beginning of the season before the Spurs were completely healthy, played in every single game, was part of that rotation every single night, 16 to 17 minutes per game. And he was part of the rotation when the Spurs were above 500, six games above 500 for the first and only time this season. After he's been removed from that rotation, the Spurs have gone the other way. And it's not because Vassell isn't in the rotation, but I would say it's, you know, he definitely had an impact on them being that far above 500 with other circumstances like strength of schedule. But I do think he is part of the best lineups that the Spurs have to offer. Oh, no doubt. I, I'd have to agree with you on that one. Again, I look forward to seeing this kid and what he's able to bring uh, come next season. Maybe he'll get more minutes and hopefully, you know, crack the rotation at some point, you know, on a consistent basis, not trash minutes against some yeah. of the better teams. I mean, the kid's only going to get better if you give him minutes out there against some of the upper echelon teams, you know. When you're going up against elite talent, you're going to up the level of your game as well. So I just think that that's ironing, shar sharpening iron, you know. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Um, let's go ahead and talk about one Luka Samanic. The beloved Luka Samanich. You either love him or you hate him. You know, and a lot of Spurs fans in the beginning of the year, let's be honest. You all know who you are. We have receipts, but I'm not that I'm not that person, so it's okay. You know, I'm not gonna call out names or none of that. But in the beginning of the season, the Spurs fans again gave the poor kid a lot of flack and they were just saying horrible things about him. And I'm like, let's be patient with this kid. He's coming from an entirely different system. He's come to, to the United States. He's trying to learn this style of basketball. They put him in the D League, you know, or the G League, should I say. He spent minutes there again this season, you know, in, in the in the gubble. <laughs> and he looked yeah. good in the gubble, you know. I'm like, if y'all aren't watching the Spurs G League team, y'all are missing out. You want to see what these young kids are capable, capable of doing? Watch the G League. That's going to show you what you want to want to know, you know, about where they can go. What's their ceiling like? What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? You know, because when they come and they play with the San Antonio Spurs at the NBA level, sure, they're not going to be able to put up a 20 or 30 point game, you know, like they were maybe in the gubble. But they're still being you're going to still see that growth. You know, you're going to still see what they can what they can do at the pro level. So I'm liking the growth out of one Luka Samanich. I think he's the candidate candidate for the most improved player of of the year for the San Antonio Spurs because he looked like a deer in the headlights in the beginning and then he went to the gubble he came back and you're like what happened to this kid yeah, like he just saw a resurgence man and and I, and I was shocked and I was very surprised and and I've loved Lucas Samanich I like his energy out there and the dude he's got handles man for a big man you know he can he can dribble the ball up the court so we're going to talk about lineups again how productive they are but remember again, Spurs fans, very small sample size. So we're not validating what everybody out there is saying as far as, oh, this this proves that they need to be in the lineup. We're just saying small sample size, limited minutes. This is what some of these lineups have looked like. So I'm going to go and look at, look at the stats here. And, and for reference, I'm going to basketballreference.com. You can look those up as well. Um, and again, per 100 possessions... What I'm looking at is one of the most productive lineups with one. Luka Simonich in the lineup has been Keldon Johnson, Jakob Portal, Luka Simonich, Lonnie Walker, and Derek White. Per the 100 possessions, they have a plus 55.1, Noah. 
this this lineup mm-hmm. has looked pretty decent. You know, I'm not going to lie. I, I get excited when I see them on the court together. What are your thoughts on this? I mean, I, I think you kind of you, you said it at the outset is it's a super small sample size because um, if they were really like a plus 55 in terms of net rating <laughs> all season pop would have them out there, you know, every minute of the game. Um, but I, I like them. I like all those young guys. I really like Luca. And, and I wanted to say, you know, I think fans have a way of creating a narrative. Um, you know, people see, say, oh, well, he's quiet, oh, so he's not confident. So with I don't Timmy- think any, any, anybody said that about Kawhi. You know, Ka- Kawhi said like three words in the six or seven years he was in <laughs> San Antonio, and nobody was saying, oh, that guy has no confidence. He just doesn't believe in his game. And, yeah, I had the pleasure of covering Luka Shamanich while he was in the gubble. And even after the games where he scores, you know, 25, had 15 rebounds, a, a few blocks, a steal, you know, four assists, same demeanor as the games that he scores eight points with, you know, four or five rebounds in 30 minutes. So I think that's just his personality. I think sometimes fans are looking too deeply into what isn't there. And I think that Luka Shamanich could be a really important part of what the Spurs do down the line. And, you know, like you said, played super well coming out of the gubble. Um, played well for the Spurs as a spot, you know, sort of starter rotation player when when uh, Rudy and Keldon were gone. I think that maybe the Spurs did a little bit of a disservice to him to sit him right after he was starting to build some momentum. Um, but but a, a really talented player, and I'm excited to see him get minutes going forward because I don't think we're probably going to see a whole lot more of him this season as long as everyone's healthy. Yeah, but are you surprised too that he's been you know he's been able to be productive and played so well? alongside you know Keldon Johnson, Jakob Portal, Lonnie Walker and Derek White, you know. I'm not I'm not that surprised about it. I mean Derek White is is an excellent facilitator. He does a lot to raise the ceiling of the other players on the defensive end and and Jakob Portal does as well. So I'm not that surprised that players play well when they play with those guys and Keldon as well. I mean Keldon does a phenomenal job in his own right. Um so no I'm not I'm not really that surprised especially given like the small sample size, but I I I'm, I really like it. I really like it. I'm encouraged by what I what I've seen and now to play devil's advocate. Uh, I think he had two points last night on one of four <laughs> shooting in like 20 yeah, minutes yeah. against the last place team in the Eastern Conference. So you would hope he would, you know, eat when he's playing those guys, you know, that he would just eat up the the opportunity. But it didn't happen. Uh, but I also think back to what I said is like it's hard to continue and maintain that confidence after you've been benched and you've seen sporadic minutes. So I don't really blame it necessarily all on him. There's a lot of factors that go into him, you know, not necessarily having the best game last night. And of course it's a one game sample size if we're just counting last night. Yep. And over the course of what the last five games, we'll start with the San Antonio Spurs versus the magic. Luca only played eight minutes in that game. He had seven points, you know, Then we go and look, okay, let's see what they did in that blowout win that the Spurs had against the Suns. Luka played 17 minutes, zero points. He had four personal fouls. You know, it happens. Then you you go ahead and go on the next night and you look at the Spurs and the Pacers. Well, Luka, he had three minutes, zero points. I mean, again, very small sample size because he didn't get a lot of run that night. Okay, and then we look and see what they did with the... With the Miami Heat, you know, Luka played four minutes, zero points in that game. Again, hardly any minutes on the court. We don't expect the kid to to get a, a minute, a, a point a minute. You know, that's kind of unrealistic. Yeah. Uh, then we see what he did yesterday against the, the Detroit Pistons. 15 minutes, two points, two personal fouls, two blocks. And he had, what, three rebounds. So... You know, limited limited run as again, you know, he had a little bit more more time out there on the court in 15 minutes. But, you know, I know what Spurs fans are saying. Some Spurs fans are like, hey, why don't we see more of Luca? I want to see Luca. Hey, Luca's always exciting to me. He's one of these players that you get excited just to see him get minutes. And really, yeah. at the end of the day, that's why I get thrilled to see him out there. Same thing with Trey Jones. Kata beats Bates Diop. When they get minutes, you're like, oh, wow. Yeah, I want to see what these kids can do, you know. And Keita Bates G- Diop, he thrilled. He he entertained us last night. He had a pretty, you know, decent game. Um, so y- you like what you see out of these young kids. But again, it's limited minutes, small sample size. Does Luca have a positive impact on the game when he's there? Yes, he has. But again, it's been a small sample size. And, and we just don't know at this point what this all will look like in the context of a full season and him really cracking that rotation and really showing us what he can do in the context 
of a full season of play. Uh, I know that you, you you still have things to say about Luca, but what do you think? We'll, we'll just go ahead and guesstimate at this point, Noah. If he plays, you know, next season he gets more minutes, what do you think the lineup can look like with him in there? What do you think he can actually bring to this Spurs uh, team that can help them uh, win games? Uh, yeah, I think first and foremost, uh, defensive versatility. He's a guy who has insanely quick feet, um, very mobile hips, good lateral mobility for someone who's 6'10", almost 6'11". He's shown he can guard anywhere from the shooting guard position up to power forward. I wouldn't put him on a center. Um, he just doesn't have the bulk, and that's not really his body or his play style. You know, he's not incredibly physical. Probably too slow to guard a, like a true point guard, somebody who's that elite burst quickness. Uh, but I also think he's very unselfish with the ball in his hands. He's a well, he's a willing passer. He's a fairly good rebounder for someone who's not overly physical. Um, and I think lastly, the thing that is going to be most important to maximizing his ceiling, helping him reach that, is learning how to shoot the three ball. I know a lot of people want to say he's a three-point shooter. Uh, and, and the honest truth, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, he isn't um, going back. And, and I did research on this. I wrote an article for Pounding the Rock going back all the way to his professional days overseas. And if you include his G League uh, attempts as well, he's a 32 percent three point shooter for his career on over 600 attempts. That's well below league average. Um, and if we just want to look at his NBA attempts, it's only 34 percent, which is still below league average. So he's going to have to do something about that three point shot, because if he can make teams respect that, he can attack closeouts, and if you're attacking closeouts, you can make the defense scramble, and he has the vision and the willingness to pass that he could kick kick it out to guys on the three-point line and keep the ball moving and really make the offense more dangerous. So I think what, for me, is the most tantalizing part of him is his potential if he can start putting some things together. Yeah, not only that, but if he can fake the three and he makes you know teams come out at him, he has a great first step. He has a long stride, and he has that Euro step that he can use – you know, quite often to perfection. Uh, so I like that out of the kid. You know, he gets past his defender with the fake, gets that long stride, then goes ahead and uses that to get into that Euro step, you know, an easy layup because he has a lot of length to him, you know, develop that little floater or, you know, get a little friendly bounce off the glass. Hey, two is two no matter how you get it. So I'd like to see uh, the kid really be able to utilize his full skill set. And I think with more minutes, more experience, we're going to see a lot uh, better play come out of one Lucas Samanich. So I'm excited to see the develop of what the development of one Lucas Samanich. So let's go ahead and talk about another Spurs fan favorite here, and that would be one Drew Eubanks. Drew Eubanks, <laughs> I mean this this dude has been playing out of his mind. No, as of late, he's just come out and he just electrifies that second unit. Even his missed dunks look great. It's like Luca wants to murder somebody. I mean, Luca Drew wants to murder somebody every time he gets the ball. And, and you love to see it. You know, he's just wanting to be aggressive, go out there, and do whatever he needs to do to help his team get the win. He's a great teammate, man. The, the guy is fun to watch even on the bench. You know, he's always cheering for his, his teammates. So I love Drew, man. Drew Drew's a, a good teammate to have in your corner and over the course of the last five games Noah and we're going to start with the Portland game Drew played 18 minutes had 15 points against Phoenix and the blowout loss the Spurs had against the Suns he played 28 minutes had 13 points against the Pacers Drew played 16 minutes had nine points against the Heat Drew played 13 minutes had six points against Detroit he played a full 18 minutes, had eight points. Not bad, I got to say. You know, he's out there doing his thing with that second unit, and, and he's just fun to watch. I mean, you can't say enough good things about Drew. I think he does some of these things that go unnoticed, especially in the paint, you know, trying to box, box out his uh, box out defenders, going up for rebounds, tipping the ball, trying to keep it alive. He's doing all those little things that you want out of, out of somebody coming off the bench. I mean, what do you got to say about Drew? I mean, Drew's been fantastic this season and inside of his role. Um, I don't want to be negative because, you know, for, for me, Drew is primarily an energy big, somebody who's going to provide a lot of energy. Um, he's going to, you know, dive on the floor for balls. He's going to fight for rebounds. He's going to contest every shot that his fingers can, you know, <laughs> get a get a, a get on. Um, but, but at the same time, I think if you're looking forward 
to the future. I'm not sure um, if the Spurs wouldn't want to look to upgrade in that area. And I think that's exactly why they handed him a, a vet, uh, like a, a minimum contract this offseason. And I think he's very, very useful in his role right now. But I think where you're going to see him be most important is as an depth insurance, injury insurance guy off the bench who knows the system, who we know knows his teammates, who we know already can play well in the NBA. So I, I like Drew, um, but I wouldn't say he's somebody – because I've seen on Facebook, which, of course, <laughs> if you go on Facebook, you're going to see some crazy things. Lots um, but crazy. people are saying on Facebook right now that Yaka Pertle should lose a starting gig for Drew. And unfortunately, Drew Eubanks does not have that versatility that Yaka brings in terms of the all-around game. Yeah. And, and I think if Drew w- wants to continue building on his ceiling, because I think people probably perceive him as having a lower ceiling, which is fair, where he can maximize his ceiling – is learning to shoot that mid-range shot better, learning to shoot the three-point shot. Now, I know he's 100% in his career from three on three attempts, but, yeah, again, small sample size. We're going to need to see more of that. He looks hesitant to shoot it there. He looks hesitant on the mid-range. Um, and we know he worked on it all last offseason, so I want to see him continue to work on it because he's a guy who's easy to root for. He's a phenomenal human being. He's a great teammate, and so I would love to see him prove me wrong, other fans wrong, and continue to carve out a role with San Antonio because he is a great great teammate i mean i i really don't have any more positive things i can say about him because it's just it's already been said you know great guy yeah i gotta agree with you i want to see me some more drew i want to see him you know develop his game a little bit more but i i just love watching the guy when he comes out on the on the court he kind of reminds me of, of the days of one malik rose when you would put malik rose out there and the crowd <laughs> would get excited because it's malik yeah and he's overachieving because he was small you know he was smaller yeah. than everybody else He's playing that center position at times, you know, going out there doing his thing. And it's just fun to watch the guy. You, you just can't He surprises help. guys. He surprises yeah. guys with his athleticism, his physicality, um, his effort, his hustle. I mean, it, it, let's, anytime he's on the court, you know you're going to be in for a show because that guy is everywhere. Drew Eubanks is absolutely everywhere. And I'm not saying other Spurs don't give as much effort as he does, but I don't think anyone does, and I'm not sure it's possible because he is – above 100% at all moments he's on the court. He's just giving it his own. I love to see that. And you can tell he loves being out on the court. He's just having fun. He's just having fun. So speaking of having fun, going to a more serious subject now, this is going to be an interesting topic for for both of us because now we're going to start getting into the the meat of our discussion, so to speak. And that's going to be why is Coach Pop so reluctant to play the younger players or the younger core? And we have a big debate. It happens every night, Noah, when we have a game, a Spurs game. You've seen it. I I think I think Twitter, Spurs Twitter is crazy. You ain't gone on to a subreddit or you haven't gone on to Facebook and seen the comments and stuff that are happening. I, I know a lot of Spurs fans are just delegated to, let's say, Spurs Twitter. But when you go to these other social media sites, you see a lot of crazy going on there. We've seen everything from people calling for Coach Pop to step down as the coach, that it's his time, he needs to retire. They blame it on him. You you have a bunch of just outrageous claims at this point. And one of the things that I'm gonna wanna I wanna get your response for is why aren't we seeing a lot of the younger core? Before I give you my response, I want to hear what you have to say. I mean, I, I think at this point, every nobody should be surprised they're not playing. I think we've seen it even going back probably to 20, about 2010. Young guys just don't get minutes. Pop really trusts veterans. He values continuity. He values the, you know, the sort of corporate knowledge that comes with being part of this team for multiple years. And it's the same reason we saw, you know, Bren Forbes and Marco play over Lonnie and Keldon all last season. And, uh, you know, it it really shouldn't be that surprising. So I think that's why, not because he has a vendetta against the young guys, not because he doesn't think they're talented, but it's trust, you know, And, and that's the key to every relationship you have in your life. And as a basketball coach, of course, you're going to play the players you trust the most. And whether Spurs fans like it or not, he trusts Patty, trusts Rudy and, 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 you know, I don't think that's going to be something that changes, especially with, you know, 10 or so games left in the season. So it's not because we like the team we have. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, You know, <laughs> I hear that all the time, oh, and Lord. I'm sure he does like the group he has. Uh, I'm sure he would also be happy to improve it, which the Spurs can this offseason. They got $50 million, so we'll see what they do with that. But um, no, I mean, 
I think it's it's a little overboard when people say you got to get this guy out of here. Um, you know, I, I think are the Spurs going to get that much better even if he was gone and someone else replaced him? You know, probably not. Yeah, and my take on the whole thing is I think it has a lot more to do with, like you were saying, trust, and it has a lot to do with experience or lack of experience from this younger core. And now here's the conundrum that we find ourselves in. In order for the younger core to get better, they need more minutes. But at the same token, you on that flip side, you have Coach Pop, who's going to go ahead and believe in his vets. You know, his vets understand the system. They know how to run the place. They don't make a lot of mistakes out there, more so than, let's say, some of the younger players who are st still learning uh, the Spurs system. You know, while they have great athletic ability and they have a great skill set, they still haven't learned the ins and outs of the game, let's say, so much as so as, as a veteran player has. So I understand the logic and what Coach Pop does, even though it's irritating at times, you know, when you have one Rudy Gay and let's say Patty Mills, for example, they're having an off shooting night. They, a lot of Spurs fans have also accused them of looking horrid on defense. And we have one Devin Vassell just sitting out there on the bench, just looking, you know, and, and the game is slipping away from us. And they're like, we'll just throw them in all of a sudden. Maybe magically we can turn this thing around. There, there's no guarantee, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think like there's no guarantee you turn it around, but there's no sense in continuing to investing minutes in guys who they're both on expiring contracts. Like I True said, that. you know, Patty's probably back. You can't guarantee that Rudy's back. Um, and, and like you said, you know, these young guys are not going to get better if they're not playing. There is no more G League. Um, they're not hardly getting into games except for garbage time. And I think there's zero value to getting in garbage time. I really do. Yeah. You know, if you're there for five minutes and your, your role is just let's, you know, let's finish this game off and let's get to the next game. Of course, it's not going to help you in your development when you're playing the other guys, third stringers, and um, you're down by 30 or 20 or 15 with, you know, limited minutes left. In so, the fourth quarter. Yeah, I, I, think it, I think it is a fair... Uh, assessment to say, you know, yes, Rudy and, and Patty probably know the system better, but I don't think that means they automatically execute, you know, everything well, nope. because I think yep. Rudy has been a good man to man defender. He has been pretty good off ball as well in a new role where he's guarding centers and forwards more now. Um, and Patty has still been pretty bad. Uh, Patty has been pretty bad on the on the defensive end. He gives a lot of effort, but he's not in the right place. A lot of times he gambles a lot, maybe too much. And, you know, whether it's fair or not for me to bring this up, Patty and Rudy have combined to shoot under 39% over their last 20 games. Um, no, None of the young guys are, are shooting that poorly from the field. Yeah. So if they're having an off night, like I mentioned earlier, there's no to me, there's no harm in getting someone in the game, you know, getting Vassell, getting Trey, getting Luca in the game. So, you know, that, that's my take on it. But my take is also... You're, you're not firing pop because he's not playing some of the young guys. That's just, that's not happening. And that's not something I want to see. Not after he's brought five championships to, to San Antonio. Yeah. I, I think at this point he's earned to earned the right to go out the way he wants, <laughs> you know, he, he, he's earned that he's earned that. So we can't just say because Spurs fans are, are irritated because of his choices or decisions that he's making in games that automatically we need to go ahead and get rid of arguably one of the best coaches to, to ever coach the game, you know, because I'm sure they're going to want to be there if he does retire, <laughs> you know, and they're going to have a ceremony for Coach Pop. Oh, my God, Coach Pop. I'm like, didn't you want him gone? And yeah, now you can't be two faced <laughs> like that. Absolutely not. No, just Where write he, it out. And he's earned that. He's earned the right to write it out. Do what he you know, do what he wants within reason as yeah. his career comes to an end, because let's be honest, he's probably not going to be here in the next couple of years. So just. Let's enjoy what we're getting from him. You know? Exactly. Just enjoy, enjoy the, it. Enjoy That's the ride. That's what I'm trying to do. Enjoy the ride. You know, but you, you brought up a good topic of discussion, too, with one Rudy Gay and Patty Mills. Because I've looked at their stats, you know, and I've looked at different different charts that they have out there. Everything from, you know, going on lineups, basketball reference, cleaning the glass. And you can see a steady decline in, in their production. And and that's both of them in each and even individually, you can see a steady decline in both Rudy Gay and Patty Mills game, you know, um, and that just, you know, it's like, again, it's a question mark. I, I believe it has more to do at this point with fatigue, because as you're coming up on that Absolutely. latter part of the season, you have all these games that are bunched together right now because of uh, the team when they had to go ahead and go into quarantine because of the COVID-19 uh, protocol. So now you're having to play all these games, and it's and it's clearly affecting players, especially your veterans, yeah. uh, that need more time to recover. So it's not necessarily that they are that bad. They're veteran players. 
they're tired. <laughs> you know, it goes to show you that this is a grueling schedule. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're uh, on their own. They're flawed as most players are. But when you're 32, 33, 34, 35, when you're getting up there, of course, a condensed schedule is going to be really tough on your legs, which is also kind of why I've been confused why up until probably the last couple games, we didn't really see any rest for Patty. Yeah. And really now it's like there's no rest for Rudy. Um, so I understand why he's not playing as well as he was earlier. But also, you know, it is worth mentioning Rudy has been doing this since his Achilles injury where he starts seasons well and then he tapers off. So I think it's always going to be a priority trying to find him rest, which is, again, why I'm kind of surprised why they haven't tried to as they're making a push for the playoffs where they could potentially need him because I don't see them benching Rudy in the playoffs, no. even if he's playing poorly. So you might as well try to get the best version of Rudy by the time you get there. Yeah, exactly. So we're kind of just, you know, touching base and letting everybody know why, you know, Coach Pop runs with these lineups, why Spurs fans are getting so upset with Rudy and Patty. This is the reason why we've seen a decline in their game as well. It just has to do with fatigue and the schedule. The same thing could be said with any of the other players here as well, regardless if they're veterans or they're younger players. It's a grueling schedule. You're going to get tired. The only difference is when you're younger, you can recover a little quicker. You know, <laughs> that day off really helps. And the younger guys, they're going to have to ice themselves down all the way up until tip-off. You know, and they still have you know, Ben Gay or what have you, you know, on you and <laughs> sitting down at the bench. I mean, hey, it's a long schedule. So I, I feel for them. Uh, but let's go ahead and break into to one of our last uh, topics of discussion here as we bring this thing to a close. Noah, that's going to be the Spurs' chances of getting into that play-in game. Now, Spurs fans are on the fence saying that Maybe the Spurs just don't make that play-in game well. I'm here to give you a little bit of good news in regards to that. The San Antonio Spurs have a great opportunity come Saturday night. As you know as you, you know as well, Noah, if they can go ahead and beat the New, Orpe New Orleans Pelicans, which this is a very critical game, if they can beat the Pelicans, the Spurs at that point in time will go ahead and eliminate the New Orleans Pelicans from playoff contention. There's no way at that point in time, mathematically, that the New Orleans Pelicans will be able to catch the San Antonio Spurs and get that 10th spot. So the Spurs have a great opportunity come Saturday night. The 10th spot, Noah, I, I mean, I, I can't believe we're even talking about this because it wasn't it about a week ago that we're in the midst of what a five game losing streak. And yet yeah. we're still here. We're still alive. I mean, what do you got to say about that? I mean, for me, at the very beginning of the season, as I'm sure you you know, I said the Spurs were a play-in range team. Surprise, surprise, they're in the play-in range. Um, but for them not to have fallen out of the play-in range after really looking like they might is is pretty impressive. Um, and, and I think it, it's going to be real. This, like you said, this game against the Pelicans is going to be so crucial. Not only will it decide whether the Pelicans still have a chance to catch the Spurs. But if the Spurs lose, they go back down to the 10th seed. That means the Golden State Warriors go back up to the 9th seed. And with the way that the schedule is panning out, it looks like the Spurs might end up playing the Golden State Warriors in the playing game. And it's not the bubble anymore. It's not going to be at a neutral site. So the, the, the Warriors are the higher seed, which means we're going to have to go to, to Oakland or where they're playing San Francisco now. We'll be going to San Francisco for a game in their home at their home arena and they've been excellent at home this season. So I don't want to see that, um, but I still do want to see a playing game. Regardless of where it is, I think it'll be really fun because um, we're way past the point of tanking for it to matter, you know? Yeah, so it's a very critical game. It's almost going to be a playoff atmosphere, I dare say, come Saturday. You know, I don't think Coach Pop has to really tell these guys what's at stake. They already know. They've been looking at the standings, I'm sure. So they know, you know what? We need to win this game. It's a must-win Circle it in red, Spurs fans, and put must win because if the Spurs want to be able to get into that play-in game without any other issues, it's imperative that they win against the Pelicans. Now, how hard is it going to be for the San Antonio Spurs squad to move up a little bit? I think they can move as high as eight. I don't believe that they're going to be able to catch the Mavericks at that seven spot. I think that's a little bit out of their range unless the Mavericks go on some you know, losing streak all of a sudden, which I don't foresee. Um, we have the Grizzlies ahead of us who right now, I believe they're playing, they have 15 games left on their schedule. 
The Spurs have 14 games left on their schedule. And then we look at the Warriors, who have a total of 13 games left on their schedule. Right now, if you're going to want to go ahead and move up to that eighth spot or that ninth spot, you can't afford to lose easy games. You have these 14 games left. If they split and go seven and seven, you know, I don't know if that's going to be good enough to get them to that eighth. Might be good enough to keep them right around 10. But if they can go ahead and finish the rest of the season above 500, at least a couple of games above 500, I think they make a good cause for themselves or a good case for themselves to actually get as high as that eighth spot. But again, we're going to need some help from the Grizzlies and we're going to need some help from the Warriors. And that help can actually come for us because the Warriors next game, which is going to be today at the time of this recording on Friday, they are going to be playing the Denver Nuggets. You know, the Nuggets are a tough team, so it's going to be a tall order for the Warriors to go ahead and defeat the Nuggets. Maybe we can get some help. If the, if the Warriors lose and the Spurs can win on Saturday, that just helps them a little bit more. You know, same thing going for Memphis. Memphis, their next game is going to be against the Trailblazers, you know, and they have a back-to-back -back against the Trailblazers. They're going to play the Trailblazers today, Friday, at 9 p.m. Then on Sunday, they're going to play the Trailblazers again. You know, so and then after that, their schedule doesn't get any easier. They play the Nuggets. Then they play the Blazers again. <laughs> Crazy that they play them three times and like four or five nights, you know. Uh, and then the Grizzlies also have the 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 Knicks, who are a hot team all of a sudden. I believe they're what the fourth in their e in the Eastern Conference. So, you know, it's it's the Knicks are no longer a gimme game, you know. So we can get some help here. All I'm saying is that the Spurs I believe they just need to be able to finish the season at least. I'd like to see them at least a game or two above 500. That's just me. Noah, what do you think? You know, how are you feeling? Do you want them to finish the, the season one or two games above 500? And if they do, where do you think they're going to wind up uh, fitting in the seating? Honestly, and I know this sounds kind of bad. I don't, I don't really care how they finish the season. I just want to see them play basketball. I want to see potentially these young guys get more minutes. Uh, and if the veterans are playing, I want to see some production out of them. I, I think it pretty much at this point is impossible for the Spurs to move up to eighth. Um, you know, Dallas has the second easiest strength of schedule left. Memphis has a 27, uh, the fourth easiest. Um, Golden State has the sixth easiest. Uh, and, and I just don't see that happening with the Spurs having now the first, the hardest strength of schedule remaining. They played the Jazz twice, the Suns twice, the Sixers, the Nets, and they only have three opponents remaining for the rest of the season that are under 500, no. being the Kings. Um, uh, who else? It was the Kings, the Pelicans, which is the game that's coming up, and the Wizards, but the Wizards are 7-1 and one in their last eight games. They're on fire right now, so even that game is not a gimme. So I don't see the Spurs moving up. I also don't see them relinquishing, uh, you know, the the ninth or tenth spot in the playoffs. I think they'll be in the play-in rather. I think they'll be just fine in that range. But I think at the end of the day, it's not going to matter that much. And I know this is probably going to upset Spurs fans, but I just try to be honest. I'm trying to be objective, looking at the Spurs' chances. If they do somehow win, you know, enough games to stay in the play-in, and they win their play-in game, and then they win the second play-in game and they get into the playoffs, right now they're looking at playing the Suns, the Clippers, or the Jazz. Um, in a four-game series with those teams, you're probably out in five. So I, I don't know how much value there is in losing in five games, but there certainly is value in getting the young guys' playoff experience. But then again, there's that double-edged sword of the young guys who are on the bench are not really playing, and they probably won't play in the playoffs. So I just, again, for me, I just want to watch basketball. I want to enjoy what the Spurs are doing, regardless if they win or lose, see some growth here and there. And I'll be happy because I really don't have expectations for the Spurs at this point in the season. I'm just here to watch some basketball. <laughs> you see, as, as Noah was uh, discussing uh, the topics earlier and he was really coming in and, and, and really letting us have it, the clouds just darkened. We saw a lot of the light. I know. <laughs> and then all of a sudden now we're ending the show and the light comes out. And now <laughs> Noah looks angelic there with the, the, the glow coming off of his skin. Say, trying to, to end things on a positive note here. So <laughs> I, I agree with you, Noah. I, I'm looking just forward to seeing the team play. You know, I, I like to see them at least finish at least two games, maybe above 500, just to see, you know, hey, maybe that might be good enough to get them into the ninth spot. Ninth, tenth, doesn't really matter. They could go as high as eight. Anything can happen. If they go as high as eight, then they only need to win once versus trying to win twice. And they need to win twice, and it's not going to be on their home court, you know, so... They have yeah. a tough task ahead of them. 
Either way, I, I'm still going to be proud of this team for what they were able to accomplish, you know, what they were able to, uh, to fight through, uh, even, you know, with, uh, you know, the LaMarcus Aldridge news that broke too, you know, with, you know, within this season where, you know, him and the Spurs decided to part ways. And then lo and behold, he was forced into retirement because of a, a heart condition. So your heart just goes out to the guy, you know, uh, hopefully, you know, maybe they'll give him a, a good send off, you know, and maybe have something special, uh, in, in store for when LaMarcus Aldridge, maybe at the end of the season or something, you know, put, put a quick video up there, but the Spurs to end the season, Noah, they have a back-to-back -back against the Phoenix Suns, which they blew out. And I think the Phoenix Suns are going to be up for a little revenge on that game. So they're going to want to make a statement. Unfortunately, it comes to us at the last two games of our regular season. So that's going to be a tall order for the San Antonio Spurs. What do you think, Noah? Do you think the Spurs are going to be good enough to split? Or do you think the Phoenix Suns are just going to absolutely take those last two games? Well, here's a positive note. If the Suns already know where they are in the playoffs, they may just rest their guys the rest of the way. And that could be just two gimmies for the Spurs, right? Like I hope. <laughs> that could possibly be two just absolute. They're playing their third stringers, their G leaguers. Um, so it won't matter that much. So hopefully that's, that's what Spurs fans can be hopeful for because it looks like the Suns are going to have trouble, um, you know, doubt for the rest of the season, either getting into that first place spot or maintaining it. So hopefully they, their fate will be decided their seating seating wise, um, so the Spurs can play, you know, their backups and, and hopefully beat up on them and gain some momentum as they're heading into the play in game. So there you have it. So as we go ahead and bring this whole thing to a close, I ba basically me and Noah are just saying all we care about <laughs> is just watching Spurs basketball. I'm sure that since we're big basketball aficionados, we're still going to be watching, you know, even if our Spurs team does not make it in. I just like NBA basketball, man. It's exciting to me. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> it is. Even if I don't have a dog in the fight, I'm just there to watch, you know, the entertainment and be entertained. You know, I just want to see teams go at it. And, and who doesn't like basketball, man? I mean, if you're a fan of the game, you're going to want to watch it until you can't watch it no more. Because let's face it, we're, we're fortunate to even have a season, you know, at the end of the day. Yeah. So yeah. as we bring this thing to a close, Noah, where can they follow you? And what do you got working on maybe that you can you can tell the people? Yeah, so you can follow me on Twitter at N underscore Magaro, M-A-G-A-R-O. You can find me on YouTube. I'm getting closer to 1,000 subscribers mm -hmm. every single day. Um, it's just my name, No Magaro George. Even if you uh, never watch a video, uh, a, su a subscription is very much appreciated. Um, and in terms of what I'm working on right now, I've got a sit-down with Shea Serrano in the works. Nice. So I'm really excited for that. Stay on the lookout for that. And uh, I've also got some draft profiles uh, on the way as well. So... Um, we're going to want to know what players could potentially go to the Spurs, and I can definitely help you um, look into that a little bit. But thank you so much, Joe, for bringing me on. I always have a lot of fun talking basketball with you, especially Spurs basketball. And you know what? I'll, I'll be rooting for the Spurs either way, uh, win or lose. I just want to see them play basketball. And, uh, you know, it has been a, a pleasure to have a season when we really could have gone without one. Yeah, and you, you forgot to model your nice San Antonio Spurs shirt. Oh, Why yeah, absolutely. Model, model for us. Absolutely. Let us know where we, we can get one. Yeah, uh, well, unfortunately, you can't get one anymore. They're all sold out. But uh, artist, he, his name is Kike. Um, you can find him on Instagram. Maybe I can send the link Joe's way. He does a lot of awesome stuff, repurposing nice. uh, like bags, uh, reusable materials, old jerseys into really cool custom sort of throwback designs for, for different teams across the NBA. Um, again, the shirts are sold out right now, but he does some great stuff. You should follow him on Instagram if you get a chance and on Twitter as well. Nice. And you know what? I got to say. Picado. Shirt, so the dude did an amazing job, man. That's all I got to say. So hats off to him. And keep an eye on him. You know, he's got some new merch and stuff coming out. I mean, you're definitely going to want to get it because... It's probably going to be released in a limited run, so pick it up while you can, Spurs fans. And make sure you go and follow Noah Magarro George on Twitter. And also, you know, make sure you subscribe to him on YouTube. He's almost at 1,000. Are you going to do something special when you hit 1,000? You're going to do a little dance, a little song for us? Oh, I'll be happy. I don't know what I'm going to do yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll definitely I'll, I'll, I'll do something for Spurs fans. If they give me a suggestion, I'm all ears. I'm all ears. But, um, yeah, I'm excited. Hopefully oh. I can reach that before, uh, you know, the season ends. If not, hopefully we reach it during the off season. I got an idea for you. Maybe if you get 1,000 subscribers, <laughs> you can give us a grito. 
<laughs> we'll see. We'll see. About, we'll see about that. We'll see. <laughs> that would be something. I want to see Noah do a grito. So let's get him to a thousand. I'm just putting things in his head. I'm just playing. With <laughs> but you can go ahead and follow me at Two Shots Podcast. And it's all spelled out T W O, Two Shots Podcast on Twitter, where I'm most active. And we can go ahead and talk anything from the world of sports to anything going on with pop culture. I just finished watching the season finale of Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And I'm going to be doing a review with our good friends from the Countdown City Geek Cast. So make sure you go ahead and check that out because we're going to be live streaming on Saturday. Oh, no, not Saturday. On Monday. And I believe it's going to happen in the evening, probably around 9 or 10. So look at my Twitter for the latest information in regards to that. I'm not going to tell you guys any spoilers because I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> so for Noah Magaro George, I'm Joe Garcia. Thank you for watching another episode of the Two Shots Podcast. And like we always say, spread the love, stop the hate. Be kind. We're out. Peace.